It seemed like any other week of television, September 23rd to 27th, 1990. Various programs, The Simpsons, Fresh Prince, Cheers, Full House, Seinfeld, Law and Order, some things don't change. When something very different happened, Americans, and a lot of Americans, tuned in to public broadcasting, to PBS, for a series about the Civil War. It's 1990, it's the end of the Cold War, looking at things differently. The Civil War is very foreign, but it is a time when the world is changing, and it's a look back to a war that also changed the world. Visually, Ken Burns had developed something that was as simple as umbrella lights and a roving camera. He had hundreds of thousands of archival photographs that exist in various collections that he had access to. So he would slowly zoom in on the photographs as if you were a person with a magnifying glass looking at them. Not only does it make it visually interesting, but each microsecond that you're viewing the photograph seems a little bit different. I mean, not quite a, a moving image like a movie, but it's a little bit different. The camera focus becomes important. Look at the soldier's eyes, the musket, the torn uniform, the scars of a slave. Details become clearer at the end of the zoom. And as Ken Burns explains it, if you show a picture of an innocent-looking young man and then zoom down, to his pockets, where there are two revolvers. You've told a story. People thought that Burns was crazy. His own father asks Ken Burns, like, what are, you, what are you working on next? Oh, I'm going to do a documentary of the Civil War. What part, his father asks. And when Ken Burns says all of it, his father just walked out of the room. <laughs> but I also think it's important to talk about something like the history of a history, the history of a documentary, historiography, you know, in a sense. How do you talk about an event and how does that change over time? Because it's so important to what I do. And my history can beat up your politics. And I find myself sympathetic to Ken Burns. This is just a snippet of something that we have on the premium podcast. It's just one of many bonus content items that you get with the premium podcast. www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com dot com sign up it can be as low as two dollars a month what do you get you get a separate podcast from this one that has extra bonus episodes i mean there's been 30 of them you get access to all those past premium episodes plus you get archived episodes of the regular podcast you're going to get 25 of the most popular episodes of my history can beat up your politics with your subscription, if you sign up at the lowest level, friend of my history can beat up your politics, just $2 a month. If you sign up for the Chester Arthur Club, $4 a month, you get 100 archived episodes. Plus, you're going to get that premium podcast with regular episodes being played. If you sign up for the Grover Cleveland or the Cincinnati, the ultimate support for the program, you're going to get the entire archive of my history can beat up your politics. And... The thanks of a grateful podcaster. Consider that www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com. Now I'm going to play an interview that I had very briefly with um, Chris Novenbrino about the whole DNC and Donna Brazil situation. A little bit of history behind parties and candidates and fundraising and that sort of good stuff. Uh, hear it now, and the entire interview will be on the premium podcast. Hey, Chris. Hey, Bruce. How are you? We've got uh, Chris Novenbrino of the Don't Worry About the Government podcast on the program today. And uh, I'm interviewing him, and he's interviewing me at the same time. Oh, it's intense. It's a two-way interview. <laughs> I think the best thing to talk about uh, is all of this crazy stuff going on with the Donna Brazil book hacks that came out. Um the allegations, um, I found it just from moment one to be a little bit uh, too much. Uh, just the the whole, uh, I trembled as I picked up the receiver to call another national Democrat 
<laughs> asked the leader of the DNC, uh, and to call Bernie and tell him the news of my investigation, which, as far as I can tell, I found the cancer, but I'm not going to kill the patient. I mean, come <laughs> on now. I mean, it, it almost was a little too obvious that it, there was some pushback on it and uh, on her book and her, her statements. And there's always a little bit of tintillating details that have to come out in the, in the, in the book publishing business and in the process of selling a book, but it just seemed like too much. Nonetheless, allegations were made. Donna Brazil, having been the DNC chair and associated with Hillary Clinton and Debbie Wasserman Schultz to an extent, making these statements gave it some credibility and certainly stirred up a lot of the people on the very left side of the Democratic Party who are saying, okay, gotcha, Here are here's a person that wouldn't have any reason to lie, and uh, here's the allegations they're making. And, you know, I heard much of that in the, in the few days after the announcement of her book. Well, there's something to that, right? Because Donna Brazil, this is interesting, right? Right after the election, there was a story that got ran in the Huffington Post where a DNC staffer stood up in the post-election day after meeting and yelled at Donna Brazil, essentially accusing her of being the face of everything that was wrong with the party. So she has always been viewed inside of like leftist politics as a party establishment person, maybe even a party hack, if you wanted to use that line. And I have found it really curious that the line of attack that has largely been promulgated from the Democrats has not been an attack against the claims that she makes in her book, which I think are verifiable. She claims on September 12th that she got a phone call from Joe Biden and she got a phone call from Jeff Weaver from the Bernie Sanders campaign. And she had an email exchange with someone from the Martin O'Malley campaign. I don't know why the O'Malley campaign was trying to wheedle <laughs> their way back in. But Come on. suffice it to say, she claims that she has these communications. So either the communications exist or they don't exist. I think pressure should be brought to bear on her to produce factual evidence to support her claims. What hasn't washed with me and I think has been kind of a loser rhetorically has been the no true Scotsman argument that has been rolled out against Donna Brazil. I, I think sort of certifiably she is a Democrat. You can't take that away from her. She was the chairperson of, of Al Gore's campaign. She was the Democratic National Committee chair twice. And she spent her entire career involved in Democratic politics. But at the same time, she's also doing curious appearances on shows like Tucker Carlson. Uh, right. I think, uh, well, her history uh, goes back. Uh, 1984, Jesse Jackson campaign, 1988, Gephardt campaign in the primaries. And then when uh, Michael Dukakis got the nomination, she was uh, involved in the general election campaign for Michael Dukakis in 1988. Now, that actually didn't go very well. And this, this was her uh, sort of uh, first brush with uh, national controversy where she took the occasion to, she really just took a swipe at George H.W. Bush and said that uh, he needs to, uh, you know, that he's an adulterer and he needs to fess up and we need to know if Barbara Bush is going to be sleeping in the White House. There was absolutely no proof for any kind. There wasn't even reports, you know, from newspapers or anything. It was just Donna Brazil essentially throwing that. She started at the that rumor. Like th there's <laughs> nothing to it other than her just throwing that out there. Uh, maybe the faintest whispers. I mean, whispers in Washington are things sure. reporters are saying that wouldn't weren't published. There was nothing certainly published. Um, and, you know, and at that time, that's all you had. You know, something had to be in a newspaper or, or on TV, or or it didn't exist. Um, but nothing more than that. And those that's probably said about everybody. And she just put it out into the public. Um, a campaign and that of course uh came back pretty hard and it looked bad for michael dukakis looked real bad they did fire donna brazil and you know she she did leave of course and i don't think there was much heard from her during that campaign in books after that i don't she expressed that she hadn't been treated well 
So it's not kind of the first time that she's been a figure, um, you know, controversial is the wrong word, because she has been associated with the Democratic Party, but um, it's not the first time she's sort of been on the ins- on the inside, on the outside, on the inside, on the outside, or uh, expressing criticism of a general election campaign. And that that, that happened in, in 1988. Of course, there was a lot of criticism of the caucus's campaign. She she was involved with the D.C. government for a while and then kind of came back into national politics after that. So she's been an operator. She's like an outsider insider of, of sorts because she comes... Well, she comes from the African-American generation in politics around like the late 70s, 1980s, where they're trying to get a spot at the Democratic Party's table. And it wasn't always a smooth road. You know, Jesse Jackson's campaign was met with some resistance to where some of the, the past criticisms have been valid, uh, I think, is that she had criticized that perhaps, you know, she's chosen as a kind of token person in a campaign because she's african-american and the party was looking for african-american turnout and motivation for the michael dukakis but that you know she was looking for something where there was she was she wanted to be a serious um consultant to the campaign and 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 to the candidate and uh that that didn't happen and those criticisms could could very well be be valid and you know i think there was quite a bit of that going on unfortunately you know it's taken some time um for african americans even in the democratic party to really reach a point where they're they're running campaigns it took another generation i mean if you're talking about the 1988 campaign with dukakis it took obama in 2008 for that dream to kind of be fulfilled especially for people of that generation yeah, I think that's I think that's true. I think that's true because Clinton's '92 campaign was very much uh, he was playing the sax. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite the same thing. Courting the African American vote, but also Sister Soldier, Sister Soldier, and making that clear. And so it was the it, and a major issue being like the crime and and kind of running against that. And then you know, as president, of course, uh, I don't think anyone would say that it it isn't better for urban areas and for African Americans generally who are looking who have a policy interest uh, to have a democratic president generally I mean our cities are getting more money and funded and and you know life is better to that extent but um, in terms of the campaign I think it, it was a it was a campaign run to make the Democratic Party pleasing to border south states and to not lose on issues like the military and crime, which, as governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton had learned that he could do that. As a Democrat, he could run and still keep a significant amount of African-American votes. And, and he had heavy support, like the Delta areas of Arkansas and in Little Rock and, and those areas in both his primary and his general election gubernatorial runs. But that he never could let opponents, and he lost his first, uh, his second gubernatorial election. He lost re-election when he let them get on the other side of him on taxes, on being a strong leader, and you know, didn't have a military in Arkansas. But there was a problem with these Cuban refugees that Carter had let in, and uh, so he did almost have a military problem as a governor in his first term. And so he learned that you don't let anybody get on the other side of you on those issues. And that's the way he ran the presidential campaign. So there was probably was a lot to criticize, but that's where Brazil has been in politics. And then in 2016, I think it appeared to a lot of people that she was just kind of a consummate insider. But there's been a little bit of of flexibility there with her. Well, you know, the other part, too, with Brazil. So how she even arrived as the DNC chair was that she arrived at the DNC chair when Debbie Wasserman Schultz was more or less unceremoniously ousted because of all the sturm und drang surrounding the fundraising mismanagement of the DNC under Wasserman Schultz, which I, I need some more specifics, but certainly the evidence currently available doesn't look good in terms of the financial management of the DNC under Wasserman Schultz. 
And then there were also these issues with how like the DNC was scheduling the debates in such a way that people weren't watching them. And a lot of people felt like the 2016 primaries on the Democratic side were really supposed to be a coronation of Hillary Clinton that got spoiled by Bernie Sanders candidacy rising up. So the issue that Brazil brings up in her book that I do think is valid and salient and is perhaps not getting enough attention is the issue around the joint fundraising agreements and particularly when a party should arrive at a joint fundraising agreement with their candidate. Um, I probably tipped my hand here on my opinion of this, but I think the only right answer on that is that a candidate should win the nomination for the presidency. And at that point, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats, then and only then should the party arrive at a joint fundraising agreement with their candidate. Because to do so beforehand, particularly in a large field, would create unbelievable amount mm -hmm. of chaos at the National Committee. Mm -hmm. Well, I have some comments on that, but before I, before we get into all that and maybe a little history behind it as much as we can, let's let's get your sense because you're really good with this stuff. Um, let me let me get your sense of what the allegation is there regarding that joint fundraising agreement. So the allegation with the joint fundraising agreement is that. Wasserman Schultz has a longstanding relationship with Hillary Clinton and that while the financial woes of the Democratic National Committee may have been valid and extant, that they were used largely as a reason, a justification to broker this joint fundraising agreement with the Hillary Clinton campaign. On top of that, if you kind of go through the records, and this is something I'm not entirely clear on, it certainly doesn't appear that it was the Democratic National Committee issuing a blanket one-size-fits-all joint fundraising agreement for every candidate. And in fact, the Hillary Clinton people, even in their defense of doing JFAs in this structure, say, well, yeah, Bernie could have had the same structure if he could have brought in as much money. That concedes that this was not going to be a one-size-fits-all thing. So that right there is an issue of equal treatment. I, I think that's a valid concern. Some of that debate occurred during the primary. I do recall that. There was a lot of debate about, oh, Bernie, you're not, you're not unlike Hillary, you're not bringing money into the DNC. Right. And, and there was actually issues around that coverage, too, at the same time about how the DNC and the Hillary Clinton campaign was moving the money around. And so one of the things that the Bernie people were saying was, well, we're not going to give money into the DNC because of the money management scheme that we think is happening at the DNC, which they ended up being right about. So like if, if we're calling that, you know, that certainly is, in my opinion, in the column of the Bernie Sanders people. Is it possible to explain like – um what a joint fundraising agreement kind of is or what the terms sure. were do we not know and and i you know i uh, this is you you know um you know my grandmother used to say uh, you know your father has a mechanical mind which implied that i didn't have one and, and you just <laughs> probably understand this much better than me okay so i I'll, I'll do the best i can so the way a joint fundraising agreement occurs uh we'll use we'll use it the way the republicans did it so on the Republican side of the aisle, a candidate, in this case Donald Trump, wins the nomination. And at that point, the candidate's campaign and the party's fate are inextricably linked because that's the way our system works. So what they do is they commingle their finances together and they agree to commingle their finances. And obviously, once you're going to start doing that, you're going to be acting in concert with one another. There's going to be frequent communication back and forth because – you don't just give money to people and never talk to them again. That's the way it works. So it's not uncommon. It's actually standard practice for a joint fundraising agreement to be arrived at. Where it's novel is the idea that you would have this commingling with all of these different people. Because what the Clinton people wanted was to also place people on the DNC. Their argument was, well, if we're commingling our finances, we want to have oversight makes perfect sense. The part that doesn't make perfect sense is the timing of that when at that point in the campaign, the function of the National Committee is supposed to be as a referee, effectively. Effectively. Yeah, well, they have, there's a, this is something that uh, 
there's a lot of issues with the perception of that and that that's obvious and they have to do they have to do a better job um yeah i think i'll i'll jump in with a couple of things and then maybe a little a little history uh and the first thought that i have uh on this joint fundraising is is to think about not just the party and the candidates but the donors and to think about how it how it works and much as we'd like to think that if I was a guy with a million bucks and I know and my history can beat up your politics is 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 you know we're doing fine but uh, I'm not a guy with that money <laughs> uh, and that I could just spare to donate to candidates or what have you um, you'd think that I'd just be catered to with my every whim and some of it does go on it's a two way street a bit but there's more the candidates commanding donors than you might think. Um, I recall from a work connection, uh, you know, an, an executive who had connection with senators and basically was at a breakfast meeting and walks in, senator comes in, guys, uh, we didn't get your check yet. <laughs> it's almost like, uh, the senator knows like you're giving, you're writing a check and you didn't write it yet. And my staff, chief of staff said they didn't get the checks yet. Please write the check, like before the breakfast begins. I mean, these are the kind of things, I mean, it's arrogant, It's it could be perceived as arrogant, but also look from the politician's side, the rare, <laughs> rare looking at it that way. Hey, we're doing all the work on behalf of your interests, and so we need you to donate. You know, you're, you're, you know we appreciate the donation, but we need it to happen. And I think um, it gets to the point where with very good donor-candidate relationships, they can actually somewhat command, tell donors to hold off. Um, one of the things that happened in 2012, for instance, is Chris Christie in New Jersey, before his, his big downfall kind of, uh, Chris <laughs> Christie in New Jersey was even being talked about for president, yeah. and ordered all New Jersey Republican donors to hold off on giving money to Mitt Romney or any of the other candidates. So they have this kind of power, because think about it, if you're a donor... You want to get the maximum influence out of your donation. So you write a thousand check to, to Mitt Romney in violation of what Chris Christie has kind of put out there. You don't have any play with the governor of the state anymore. And so, yeah, you can, you can, you know, it's, it's, you're still a donor. You're always in the driver's seat because of that, but you're not getting the maximum value because the governor's mad at you now. And so it's a reasonable, you know, there might be a time period where you do violate that, but there's this reasonable kind of period where, hey, Governor said, "Don't donate. Keep keep us on hold. He might run." And so, um, at a certain point, though, Christie decided not to run, and, and that came back and bit him. Uh, it it made the donors more tr ready to get rid of this guy because this is a guy who had set up the table as being a bit of a bully. I don't know. I actually, on this particular, on a lot of points, that's probably true. On this particular point, I think it's not uncommon for the governor of a state um, who might have a presidential ambition to say hold off and and things like this going on or to to lock up uh donors uh he did eventually say give to give to romney and i and endorsed romney indeed so this kind of mechanism can happen and i think to, the point to be considered here is how well known hillary clinton was and the relationship with major democratic donors that the clintons would have to the point where the party without such an agreement may not have had access to these people so I'm, I'm with you. I think that a part of what we saw in the 2016 primaries as well was the Republican Party and the Democratic Party not really being fully equipped to handle the shift in politic. Oh, my God. Let me try that line again. I'm with you. I think that what we saw in the 2016 Democratic and Republican primaries was both parties – not being able to adapt to the shift in our politics that is more anti-establishment. So on the Trump side, Trump was able to come in and really upset the apple cart and really upset the rules, but he did it in such a disruptive and holistic way that the Republican primary structure had to bend to his will. Bernie Sanders came in and did that as well. Now, to your point, Bernie had no relationship with the Democratic donor base. So there's an entire infrastructure that was 
looking for their portal of control that was only going to be through the Hillary Clinton campaign. Or I mean, maybe they could have done it with the Bernie Sanders campaign, but it would have been done on the fly, much more on spec. And, and so it would be more tenuous. Hillary Clinton was a known entity. And I think Bernie's success in the primaries, which was surprising to me, I think it was probably surprising to you as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't think he was going to perform like this. I think it's more of a reflection of the sign of the times than necessarily anything he was doing. Yeah, I, I knew that he was probably going. I said um, a year before, there's before I even knew candidates, who, what candidates would be. Maybe Warren was going to run or something like that. I said there's going to be a surprise in either Iowa or New Hampshire. And even after Bernie won New Hampshire, I thought that was the biggest win he was going to have. So obviously that was, you know, we 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 that's prognostication is a dangerous business, you know, and all of that. Um, and over and and I think the one comment important to make overriding everything we're discussing as we get in the nooks and crannies and I might talk a little bit about more history of parties and and donors and things like that and control um overriding this is the public relations failure of all of this like yeah so we didn't predict it like we, you and you know normal prognosticators didn't predict it people in these campaigns need to adjust day to day as bernie got stronger and stronger the public relations strategy was terrible. It was like, well, let's beat this guy. And it is a primary campaign. And it's, I do think some of the hindsight of attacking a person for essentially running a primary campaign, you know, it's, it is a, it is a primary campaign and there's going to be attacks back and forth, uh, within some kind of, you know, uh, uh some kind of ceiling of how intense the, the attack should be. There is nonetheless in every primary the Democrats have had, there's going to be attacks among and in the nineteen eighty seven to nineteen eighty eight primaries with the you know, the, the seven dwarfs, if you will. Uh right, right. sure, Bruce, sure. Bruce Babbitt was kinda of tall, but the rest of them you know, were were there was a lot of very nasty attacks, uh and and you know, between the candidates and and that always happens. But it, it should have been anticipated that Bernie Sanders was more than a candidate that there was a movement behind it and a movement that could be very useful for the other elements of the democratic party in in a coalition and instead i think it was treated as if he was a regular candidate running and there's no interest in kind of reaching out and doing something like this while it might there might be reasons that it's valid um looks really bad it continues to look really bad um, there's still, I think, a lack of, uh, they're, they're letting a story get out there. They're letting a bad perception get out there and they need to really have a summit and get to some agreement between the, yes. the sides of the party. Yes. I mean, it's what I was talking about last time I was on the show here that this is another part of the continuing saga of the democratic party rift and, whether Democratic establishment types, Hillary Clinton supporter types, people who might like Christian Gillibrand or Cory Booker, whether they are on board with Bernie Sanders and Bernieism, Bernie represents clearly a non-negligible part of the Democratic coalition, and I would argue a part of the coalition that's large enough that losing them or disenfranchising them makes Democratic victories, even in an era of Trump, an uphill struggle. As a point that I made on my show uh, the last episode, big D Democratic Party has to be small d. Even if you feel as an establishment Democrat, as a moderate Democrat, as somebody maybe who's been working really hard, and and it, even if you feel that you're in the right, uh, do you want to be right or do you want to be president, <laughs> the old uh, saying, um you're, there's something about that party that come, goes back to Jefferson and Jackson that must be democratic. And so even if you feel that the rules are, are right, you have to take a look at it and, and say is it, it, there, there's a kind of extra moral test um, for that party. I mean, Republicans wouldn't like me saying that, but I think what I mean is there's a kind of – it's always been, at least in its marketing – a party of the people, a party that goes out and reaches a large group of people. And 
you can't do that and also say like, well, we, we can have these kind of establishment rules. It's just not going to look good, and it's not good advertising for your party. Party depends on big turnouts to win election. That's been historically, it's been rare that Democrats have won because of um of a small turnout, maybe an incumbent election. Um, but his, certainly not in recent vintage. It's it's no. one of the reasons that the Democrats have been losing a lot of state and local elections is that those tend to be lower turnout and lower turnout elections tend to advantage the Republican candidate generally. And they don't tend to one one observation about all the state and local races. They're horrible for if your party strategy is going to be that you're using the to the internet to mobilize people that you're um uh it's a new kind of politics you're getting new voters out and if you have a strategy that's very media driven uh so um you know whether we agree with the argument or not there's a contention that the the, the left has the media uh and certainly I will say candidate like say an Obama um, is definitely media driven. It's a top of the ticket driven strategy. And you're going to get turnout. You know, he got good turnout in 08 and in 12. But in state elections, there's limited state coverage of politics. We don't, we don't sit and watch on the TV every day about what's going on, you know, in Tallahassee or Jefferson City or Sacramento or Trenton. You know, uh, we, We hear about what's going on in Washington day after day. It's probably too much for the amount of output, for the amount going on. Maybe with the Trump administration, that's changed a little. But it's probably too much coverage, uh, too much diet. Uh, It's a, you know, there's not as much state coverage. Most state TV is very low audience. It will tend to be an older audience for state politics. They'll. If they continue on that kind of strategy, they'll probably always have a problem there until there's better, like, uh, coverage of state elections. Yeah, typically, if you know who your governor is and they are well known across the country, it's because your governor is doing something bad. So, given all this, that you don't have that advantage that the uh, RNC probably has in, in state elections and, and will somewhat continue to, to have, you have to go for the turnout blizzard. That's your strategy, that you can just awake these shock troops that come out and vote, as had happened in happened in the elections in uh, Virginia and, and New Jersey and other elections in the off year here. Um, and off years sometimes say thing about national politics. I think they're often overstated. It's almost always brought up what happens, particularly with that New Jersey election, because it's very often the opposite of the president uh, presidential election. I went all the way back to George McClellan in 1881, and uh, he was uh, he was elected as a Democrat after Garfield had been elected as a Republican, and people brought that up that the Democrats are coming back after their election loss in 1880. So. It happens, uh, but it doesn't. It, is it if it's going to make a real statement? Is it, is that statement going to be real? Will depend on turnout and angering people and not having good public relations. Uh, yeah, my observation would be there's trouble there. They got to work something out. I'm not in charge. Um, then they don't pay me. <laughs> no, the check I, bounced. But, Last but week's check bounced. I'm unimpressed by the job that Tom Perez has done so far. Well, I think it's an establishment choice, and he's probably, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, because this is all that matters, uh, the perception. And, and if it's just these kind of halfway or middling choices, or if he doesn't have enough real power or whatever it is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. A little bit, I think, of history here about parties and candidates, because in the larger arc of history, I don't think it's that strange that a leading candidate or leading faction in the party controls the party. And I don't think that these DNC elections or uh, nomination contests are really always absolute, like, neutral events. And uh, you, And there's a big history between... Uh, with with parties getting bankrupt after an election, I mean they they spend everything they can to win, and then they're often like just sources of debt. Um, go back to nineteen, go way back, like nineteen twenty four, they had this huge um, 
convention in New York that lasted many days and 104 ballots. It went on and on, and they incurred this huge debt. So in order to pay that debt for the 1928 convention, they had to have it in Houston. And the reason they did is because uh, this fellow, Jesse Jones, um, in Houston, I hope I have the name right because he's a prominent figure there, um, there's still things named after Jones, um, I believe it was Jesse Jones, uh, prominent uh, merchant, uh, maybe some oil uh, early on. He hosted the 1928 convention. They barely had a convention hall you know, ready to hold all the, the Democrats, but that's because he offered to finance some of that debt and also uh, host the convention for free if Democrats had it in Houston. So everybody went down to Houston and had the, had the convention there. Uh, one of the funny stories about it, that's the convention that nominates Al Smith. Now, Al Smith was a wet, and the New York City Tammany Hall guys were known for drinking a bit, but, you know, Houston at that time was a dry town, and so they weren't able to, you know. So they were told by the Tammany Hall leaders just to do a lot of, like, calisthenics and, uh, you know, try to try to avoid the urge and then go drink when they got home. Al Smith also got the nomination, and he was connected to Jones. He had won the Texas delegation over. So it was both a uh, way of... Um, paying the debt of the Democratic Party and also getting um, Al Smith the nomination. And that's just one of many things. I think back to a candidate like the last candidate that I really think is comparable to uh, Bernie Sanders, in a sense, would be George McGovern in 1972. And I do believe if you look at that contest, he had to fight the DNC itself and the establishment at the Democratic convention in order to win the dnc over they were not the, the democratic establishment was not working for him and uh they they actually i mean the chairman resigned or offered to resign after his nomination because it's like you're in control of this now he replaces the dnc chair once he wins the nomination but up until the point where he got the nomination he had to fight a lot of the the dnc and I don't think fundraising was as well documented. I mean, it was documented, but I think there was a lot of informal, whether you had these like joint fundraising agreements or not, there was a lot of informal control. Like, you're not going to get the fundraising from this labor union or that labor union if you're not with us. You know, if you're not um, uh, in 68, I mean, Humphrey's campaign was pretty much run by the AFL-CIO. And, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't, yeah, Eugene McCarthy or other candidates running or Bobby Kennedy during the time. I mean, they, they're they not going to have access to some of the same city bosses or or um, labor unions that would have raised money. So I think that, you know, uh, it's not entirely without history that um, that there's this deep connection between one faction and the party and the party until the nomination is won by somebody but um and 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 it's really rare that there would be an absolute neutral feel like people party regulars would have no desire to to decide a who's going to be the party's head going into a general election that they all want to win and b deciding who's going to be their new boss which is what happens when a candidate wins the nomination they generally replace the DNC chair they they can so it's um uh, expecting neutrality is probably something that, like, historically is strange. Now, that's me talking. I know that a lot of people listening, and especially a lot of new voters and people that were energized by, say, Sanders, aren't going to like that very much. And they would like to see that history change. History's fine. History needs to change. We have to move into the future, that kind of thing. So, um, and I also understand that argument, and I, I would cast that over to Perez and others if they're running a party they have to consider uh, what this looks like and how are you going to make this better going into to particularly into 2020 so it's not just an optics thing I, I i think you are right to say that there is clearly an issue of how this is perceived and the optics of this and if you're an establishment type at bare minimum 
I would hope you would concede that the structure of the party currently is a bit of an optical nightmare for a Democratic Party to have clearly not Democratic tendencies inside of it, like superdelegates, like having a coronation ceremony disguised as a primary system in 2016. Those those are problems. But I, I think there's actually a bigger issue here in that. Because the way the Democrats have currently structured their primaries are almost in a coronation style, you're not actually using the primary system to do the most useful thing, which is find the best and strongest candidate. So I think probably the more salient criticism isn't just on the optics side. It's that you're not using the primaries to go through this field and let's take a real look at Martin O'Malley. I, I don't know why, but or Jim Webb. Again, I, I'm not sure why, but to actually have those people stand scrutiny and see if any of those people catch on with the general public, like a Bernie Sanders. This is a guy who you wouldn't have thought would have caught on in 2008 and probably wouldn't have caught on in 2012, but this was his moment. Maybe there's something here, but even at bare minimum, it might tell us something really useful about the coalition and how to coalition build going forward. I think that's definitely more of a a lesson now uh, with 2016. But I also think the what I would say to that is I believe that a lot of people really did think that they had the candidate. Like, in other words, Hillary Clinton looked good for a lot of reasons, at least this is a very establishment kind of viewpoint. Um, Secretary of State, uh, well-known first name. First woman president. First yeah, woman well-known president. Uh, the very fact that she has access to all these donors while it's a negative, it really did. It was strange that it became a negative during the campaign. You have to think about it that way. That's more the result of having Trump as a candidate who was able to say, like, hey, I'm not doing all this fundraising, but any other RNC typical candidate – that Jeb Bush or such would have had a difficult time running against fundraising like that or making a fundraising such a bad thing for for a lot of Democratic candidates because the party always struggles with this fundraising or it hasn't had in the past. Um, that actually looked like an asset. Now we look at it like wasted money. But I think it's important to note here, too, is that I don't think that Hillary Clinton and her campaign striking the joint fundraising agreement with the DNC in August of 2015 was a play designed to thwart Bernie Sanders. I actually don't think that they were thinking a whole hell of a lot about Bernie Sanders' candidacy being a serious candidacy in August of 2015. Right, and I think if it had happened in 2016, it would almost be more – of a guilty action, right? I mean, the 2015 yes. indicates it's a that bad you look. Just... Well, I've been speaking with Chris Novenbrino of the Don't Worry About the Government podcast. Chris, you also have a, a wrestling podcast. What's the name of that? I do. It is called Lucha of the Hidden Temple. It is over on Voices of Wrestling. We're very excited to announce that there will be a season four of Lucha of the Hidden Temple. Uh, for those of you who are listening to this show, I'm actually I'm well known in the politics realm. I'm actually more well known in the wrestling realm. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but I'm happy to have listeners wherever they are. And we will be back at some point in 2018 with more episodes of Lucha of the Hidden Temple. My news and politics show is called Don't Worry About the Government. You can find us over at patreon.com slash DWATG. Our homepage is don'tworry.tv. On Twitter, we are at DWATG. And I am on Twitter individually at C-H-R-I-S-N-O-V-E-M-B-R-I-N-O. Thank you so much for having me on again, Bruce. Chris, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for listening. And remember, subscribe to the premium podcast at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com and you'll hear the whole interview with Chris. Thanks for listening.